Uh, it is a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to host uh, uh, Professor uh, John, John Jeffries uh, Martin. Uh, Professor Martin is chair of the Department of History uh, at Duke University. Uh, he's a historian of, of early modern Europe with particular interest, as you see, in social, cultural, and intellectual history in Italy in the 16th and 17th century. Uh, he wrote a number of books about Venice. Uh, Venice's uh, Hidden Enemies, Italian Heretics in the Renaissance City, won a number of uh, important uh, prizes uh, in, for, for, you know, uh, in uh, America and elsewhere. Uh, he co authored uh, several vol volumes of Venice Reconsidered, the History of Civilization of an Italian City State, uh, the Renaissance, uh, Italy and Abroad, wrote about the uh, heresy, culture, and religion in early modern Italy. Uh, Renaissance world, etc., uh, etc., et and also uh, more pertinent uh, to our uh, to our theme, uh, wrote about uh, growth, the birth, the development of the of individuality and the idea of the self, especially as you have all read this article. I, I assume uh, the growth of the notion of uh, sincerity in Renaissance and Reformation, Renaissance and Reformation uh, Europe. He's now going to talk about uh, uh, the notion of individuality from uh, Montaigne to Calvin. And uh, we welcome you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Avian. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and I appreciate the invitation enormously. It's my first time in Israel. I hope not my last, but loving Tel Aviv. And the climate is perfect, although apparently it's not like this all year. It warms up in the, the summer. Um, I, I wanted to say that the theme uh, of the self, the history of the self, which you've been looking at uh, this uh, last period of time in your seminar, is, I think, an extraordinarily important theme in this moment for a variety of reasons. And in thinking about why it's important, I feel that the reason we're turning to the history of the self is we're living in a period where our own ideas about our identity and our identities are shifting quite rapidly. Um, I, I'll give you one personal example. A few years ago, I logged on to Amazon to buy a book. And of course, I have an Amazon account, like most professors have an Amazon account. And it said, when I logged on, welcome John. If you are John, <laughs> you recommend the following book. And the book they recommended was the book I had intended to buy, which meant that the algorithm in the Amazon database had predicted the book that I would buy next. And it made me realize that maybe I have no free will. Perhaps <laughs> there are algorithms at work in my actions that shape my next step. But on a more sinister side, we are now, each of us, archiving ourselves daily with every swipe of the credit card, with every use of the cell phone, with every time we do a Google search. And that's changing our sense of who we are and our identities. And as we go through this kind of wrenching and fast period of thinking about our identities and how ourselves perhaps are being remade in fundamental ways, it's quite logical that we would turn to the history of the self as an important subject. I think it's an incredibly important subject to think about. Um, and I also think that it's interesting from the vantage point of European history. I know that many of you work on Asia and the Islamic world and are not Europeanists, but from the vantage point of European history, we see quite a significant shift taking place from the history of individualism, the old way of posing the question, what were the origins of the individual? A question that goes back in my field, particularly to Jakob Burkhardt in his great book, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, the 19th century, to the history of the self. The idea that the idea of the individual is but one construction of the history of the self. That the idea of the individual is not a given. There are different formations of the self in different kinds of society. I also want to say that there is, for me, a particularly pleasant serendipity in this invitation. And that is that I'm just now, I pray, this summer, finishing a book on a quite different topic. And 
as a result, I found myself in beginning to think about this presentation with an opportunity to begin to think about what I hope will be my next book, which will be, I hope, a history of sincerity in early modern Europe, particularly Europe in the 16th and first part of the 17th century. And this is obviously, if you've, I, I love the phrase when you said, you've read his article, I assume. <laughs> and I, I worried a little bit about that, I assume. It indicated to me that maybe not everyone had read the article, and that's fine. But if you have read the article, you know that I've been working, or I've been thinking about sincerity now 20 years ago. The article came out in 1997. But I haven't had a chance to really come back to that theme in a very pronounced way, even though I had originally intended to more rapidly. But there's an advantage in that delay, and the advantage is that I really have grown to see a lot of limitations in the way I approach the theme of sincerity in the late 90s. And in particular, I feel that I approached it in a deeply Protestant heat. <laughs> I, I, I was fascinated by sort of Protestant ideas of sincerity without thinking at that point much more outside were there other formulations of sincerity, Catholic ideas, Jewish ideas, ideas that would perhaps complicate this notion of, of what sincerity was. And so this talk has really precipitated in me a, a desire, a fantasy perhaps, to write a book that would look at different formulations of sincerity in the early modern period, both uh, Protestant and Catholic, and both Christian and Jewish ideas about sincerity. And in the way that I'm beginning to formulate the ideas today, and I'm going to sort of talk about uh, this in this fashion today. I'm doing this really by looking at particular thinkers. So I'm using Calvin uh, to look at Protestant ideas about sincerity, Montaigne to look at Catholic ideas about sincerity, and Spinoza to look at Jewish ideas about sincerity. I know there is a radical oversimplification in reducing religious movements to particular individuals. I'm not really trying to make a radical reduction, nor do I imagine a book that would focus only on those three. I imagine at least adding Descartes for generational uh, continuity, would fit nicely between Montaigne and Spinoza, and also is important for our understanding of Spinoza later on. So I'm imagining this book I, I want to be honest with you about that because I, I want in our conversation, and I hope we'll have a lot of questions and a lot of dialogue and debate later on in the seminar, I, I want to say that what I'm imagining is a, is a book that is, if, let's say that it focuses on John Calvin and Michel de Montaigne and René Descartes and Baruch Spinoza, it would have, obviously, as its center of gravity, early modern France and the Netherlands with Descartes and Spinoza. It would reach from the history of Portugal and the Inquisition in Portugal through the history of uh, Sweden in the mid-17th century with Descartes. But its focus would be primarily Western Europe. It would, but by being focused largely on France, it would enable a lot of consideration to social and political conditions in France and how they may have informed, and the Netherlands, and how they may have informed ideas about sincerity and a concern with the question of sincerity. Uh, but it would also transcend the French uh, state as well. Um, I realize, and I want, to, I want to make this quite explicit, I realize that this is a deeply Eurocentric endeavor that I'm embarked on, but it needn't necessarily be completely Eurocentric. Um, one of the most fascinating aspects of, I think, the development in the intellectual history of Europe and its first modernity has been increasing attention to intellectual exchanges and ideas about other cultures that were developing in this period. Um, and one can find uh, parallel concerns in uh, Islamic communities in the Mediterranean. One, one finds the most fascinating influences is a little bit later uh, about the way in which Islamic texts, for example, influence 
uh, what we think of as European ideas about the self. The most famous uh, discussion recently has been about Locke. John Locke, in his essay concerning human understanding, uh, has the famous image of the mind as a blank slate. And that idea comes, we increasingly believe, from a medieval Muslim novel on a, on a gazelle raised on an island that was translated by Locke's tutor into English uh, just before Locke wrote the essay. And, and so we see these exchanges in a way that we did not see them before. No, it's actually was, translated into Hebrew almost immediately. It is that right? Deep, yeah, it had a deep influence on Maimonides. Yeah, yeah interesting. Even to five, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so, so that's to sort of set up um, the general focus of my, of my remarks. I am going to um, uh, focus primarily on Calvin and on Ben. I will say a few things about Spinoza at the end. My talk is organized in such a way that at first I will be focusing on the text and on matters of intellectual history. How do we excavate ideas about the self through a study of what Calvin has to say about sincerity first and what Montaigne has to say about sincerity. I hope to show that there are two different models of the self that emerge in these two texts. And then I hope to provide in a very uh, uh, preliminary and unsatisfactory way some ideas about the social and political uh, forces that lead to these concerns with uh, sincerity in both writers. And then I'm going to turn briefly with some very brief comments about Spinoza and why I think, if, if there's one, and why, why I think he would make an interesting figure to bring in here as well. So the first, the first thing I want to emphasize is that, of course, there is a history of the virtues in general. The, the way we think about virtue in one society at one time period differs quite significantly from earlier time periods. And while we can find ideas in classical literature and in medieval literature that approximate or come close to the notion of sincerity, it's only in the 16th century, I would argue, that sincerity becomes a dominant theme and a dominant preoccupation. And we can see a kind of shift in the meaning of the term sincerity. Um, sincere uh, in, in Latin, uh, sinceros, really meant pure or unadulterated. So one could speak about a sincere wine. A doctor could speak about sincere urine. Sincere focus on a tangible substance. It, you could talk about purity if you talked about sincerity in medieval Latin, sinceritas. And you could talk about purity of heart, purity of soul, purity of intention. But the idea that sincerity is a virtue that connects what is inside putatively inside of us to our external expression is really a preoccupation of the 16th century. We find adumbrations of it in certain Renaissance authors such as Petrarch and Lorenzo Valla, but it's in the 16th century that it explodes. It becomes a major part of the discourse of this period. And the explosion that occurs is located, I used to believe, predominantly in Protestant discourse, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that discourse now. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to say that, that many scholars have dealt with the emergence of sincerity in the 16th century um, from one vantage point or another. The most famous of them is Lionel Trilling in his really quite astonishingly beautiful text, Sincerity and Authenticity, and Trilling makes a gesture to kind of a social historical explanation, which is useful about the origins of sincerity. He sees it as a, um, a, a, as a consequence of the dissolution of the feudal order and the diminished authority of the church. I'll come back to that idea later in my re remarks, because the breakdown, a breakdown of a traditional order perhaps does contribute to a fascination with the issue of sincerity. There, there was certainly a discourse in the 16th century, a huge discourse around dissimulation and deception. And this discourse around dissimulation and deception was um, so widespread that the discourse on sincerity perhaps was a response to this preoccupation that courtiers and flatterers 
were too often engaged in speaking artificially about their beliefs. In the article that I assume all of you have read, there is a um, discussion of, of how I, I think certain theological developments at the end of the Middle Ages, particularly Occam's ideas, play a role in dismantling certain medieval notions of harmonies between God and the individual that contribute to uh, theological developments, that contribute to sincerity. But I think that another change in the 16th century, and this is a theme that will be central to my, um, my remarks on both Calvin and surprisingly on uh, Montaigne, uh, was the emphasis on the practice of confession in the, in the 16th century in both Protestant and Catholic cultures. Um, certainly different ideas of confession. For Calvin, confession is of the individual person directly to God. Within Catholicism, confession is predominantly to a priest, sacerdotal confession. So it's mediated by, by a priest. Um, but the emphasis, the idea that one should confess and the practices associated with confession, the idea of contrition and purity of intent and confession certainly underlie ideas about sincerity in the early modern period. Now, while Calvin plays a um, pivotal role in the articulation of sincerity in the 16th century, he is not the first author, Protestant author, um, to begin to raise this concern. And one of the first uh, text that I think is of great interest uh, for the discussion of sincerity comes from Martin Luther in a commentary Luther writes on the book of Psalms. And actually the book of Psalms occurs in um, Luther and Calvin and Spinoza as a very important text in its relationship to sincerity, not, not in, in Montaigne. Luther believed that the, the book of Psalms um, surpasses other moral tales because, quote, it preserves not only the trivial and ordinary things said by the saints, but their deepest and noblest utterances, those which they use when speaking in full earnest or full sincerity and all urgency to God. It not only tells us what they say about their work and conduct, but also lays bare their hearts. The idea of externalizing the heart, laying bare the heart, will become an important trope in the early modern world on the idea of sincerity. It enables us to see into their hearts and understand the nature of their thoughts. Luther writes, the human heart is like a ship on a stormy sea driven about by winds blowing from all four corners of heaven. In one man there is fear and anxiety about impending disaster. So if you're, if you're about to sink on a ship, you are afraid and anxious, right? Another groans and moans about the surrounding evil. One man mingles hope and presumption out of the good fortune to which he's looking forward, and another is puffed up with confidence and pleasure in his present possessions. So the human heart is not one thing. The human heart is diverse. According to our circumstances, if we're wealthy and content with our wealth, if we are at sea and we're about to crash we are, or sink, we're going to have a different uh, set of feelings. Such storms teach us, Luther writes, to speak sincerely and frankly and make a clear breast. For a man who is in grip of fear speaks of disaster in a quite different way from one who's filled with happiness. And a man who's filled with joy speaks and, and sings about happiness quite differently from one who is in the grip of fear. They say that when a sorrowing man laughs, or a happy man weeps, his laughter and his weeping do not come from the heart. In other words, these men do not lay bare or speak things which lie in the bottom of their hearts. It's quite an interesting passage. We are emotionally in different states at different times. We can express clearly what our internal emotion state is. We lay bare our hearts. We can 
while weeping on the inside, laugh on the outside, and vice versa. So we can also dissimulate. Calvin, in his commentary on the Psalms, actually envisions a new model of sincerity. And in his commentary on the Psalms, he makes his fondness for this part of the Bible clear. Let, let me say something about this fascination with the Psalms. This already suggests in a quite interesting way, that there is a rhetoric to sincerity, and the Psalms themselves provide a rhetoric for sincerity. They provide models for how one expresses grief, or happiness, or joy before God. So it's not as though sincerity is not never mediated by language. It needs a language, a rhetoric, to uh, mediate it. So Calvin writes of this book of the Psalms. He says, I am, I am used to calling this book the anatomy of all the parts of the soul. For not an affection will a man find in himself an image of which is not reflected in this mirror. Nay, all the griefs, sorrows, fears, misgivings, hopes, cares, anxieties, in short, all the troublesome emotions with which the minds of men tend to be agitated, the Holy Spirit has here offered a vivid picture. The other scriptures contain the commands which God enjoyed his servants to bear to us. But here are prophets themselves talking with God, because they lay bare all their inmost thoughts. Invite or help every one of us to examine himself in particular, lest any of the many infirmities to which we are liable, or the many vices with which we are beset, should remain hidden. A rare and surprising benefit when every lurking place having been explored the heart is brought into light, cleansed from hypocrisy, the most noisome pest. So the idea here is quite interesting. The idea is a little more aggressive about reading one's own heart than Luther. That reading one's own heart is a cleansing process. You look inside, you read the Psalms, you think about your own soul in the mirror of the book of Psalms, you identify the passions that lie within you, you read those passions, you try to cleanse those passions, in the process of reading them, but you're also enjoined by Calvin to a particular frankness or candidness or honesty or sincerity about what lies within you. This value that Calvin places on sincerity is quite, quite stunning, and it's repeated throughout his writings. He, for example, is deeply critical of those evangelicals who've accepted the gospel in a Lutheran key, he's deeply critical of their uh, prevarications. If they, for example, are heretics who've accepted Calvin's teachings and they're living in Bologna or Pavia in Italy, but they have not made clear their internal beliefs, they are hypocritical. They are what he calls Nicodemites, and they're guilty of this kind of deception. He writes against the Nicodemites in France a great deal and writes four treatises in which he's deeply critical of them. To him, it's imperative that one speak one's own internal truth. And that, of course, in the 16th century, at a time when there's the Inquisition and there are threats to speaking the truth, is a dangerous practice. But Calvin's quite unforgiving of those who prevaricate. He says you really have to make a clean break. You, otherwise, you're being entirely hypocritical. And we know um, that many individuals, for example, in Italy, when I studied the Inquisition, there were several individuals whom I encountered who really grappled with the issue that they were forced to dissimulate, and they struggled with this issue of, of dissimulation. Calvin also moves us away from a kind of medieval, and I developed this more in the piece in the American Historical Review, he moves us away from an idea that there is a underlying um, concord or harmony between the individual heart and God to the idea that our individual hearts are so diverse, right? One of us is afraid that we're about to uh, be shipwrecked. Another of us is happy with his or her possessions. We have different places that we are in the world. We have different internal states. And Calvin sees this great variety as a notion that it's not obvious that we're all sharing in the same experience at the same time. We need to speak openly about what is going on within us. We need to speak openly about what is going on within us so that we make a clean breast 
And the idea here also relates to the idea of a cleansing, of a repurifying of the internal state. It's not only expression of what is inside, it's also expression of what is inside meant to be a transformative act, as is the experience of confession, right? That through penance, we are transformed. Through contrition, we are transformed. We not only say what's happening, saying what's happening changes who we are. So Calvin offers this idea of an expressive self, and certainly under the influence of Romanticism, the idea of the expressive self, is a fairly uh, intuitive concept to us in the, in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, it, it's also an idea that I think this, this sort of romantic idea of the self influenced my own thinking about Calvin originally. But I want to focus on three aspects of this Calvinist view of sincerity, just a little bit, that I think deserve attention in understanding his construction of the self. First, it is based on a profound sense of the interiority of the individual. It's a huge emphasis that the true identity is not the fact that you're wearing the robes of a courtier or that you're dressed as a peasant, but that it's what's going on inside of you, combined with the presumption that the individual may either choose or not choose to make his or her interior state known to others. Secondly, it's predicated on the idea of a narrative self. It assumes that the individual's life is best understood biographically in terms of his or her development or not over time. The self is not static. It develops. It can be transformed. Um, but it can be true at a particular moment in time. And finally, and this is a crucial point, it ex assumes that the expression of one's thoughts or beliefs or feelings is transformative and even redemptive. And that this is the case whether or not one is confessing directly to God or to one's fellows and community. And this redemptive quality of expression imputes purity of heart to the believer as well. This is what Calvin means by the cleansing aspect of making a, a sincere statement about who one, what one believes or thinks. But above all, transparency, um, and this would include transparency to self, which is also a struggle for Calvin. It's not easy to know oneself. It's, it's not obvious what one is thinking. This becomes deeply problematic in Calvinism later on. It's held to be fundamental to the value of community. Now, in the second half of the 16th century, Michel de Montaigne um, also offers a model of sincerity. At first, much of what Montaigne has to say might remind us of Calvin. Famously, Montaigne's Essays is a text, often a quite vehement uh, statement against masking against dissimulation and against hypocrisy. Montaigne opens his book with a claim to sincerity. C'est ici un livre de bonne foi. This is a book written in good faith. He writes in his brief address to the reader, adding, I want to be seen here in my simple, natural, ordinary fashion, without straining or artifice. For it is myself that I portray. Montaigne frequently claims that he's being completely honest with us. What's fascinating about that, if you fall in love with his essays, as I've done over the last several years, is he's often lying to us. <laughs> but he says he's always being honest with us. So he has a kind of proto Rousseauian quality in that sense. Um, I have an open way. I do not refrain from saying anything, however grave or burning. A generous heart should not belie its thoughts. It wants to reveal itself jusqu'au dedans, just down to its innermost depths. I like to see people speak up bravely among gallant men and see the words go where the thought goes. And these gestures are confirmed by his anti-rhetorical essay on the vanity of words 
And certainly he portrays himself as sincere in his own behavior, even when there are pressures to dissimulate. Let me quote a fascinating passage. Now for my part, he writes, I would rather be troublesome and indiscreet than flattering and dissembling. I admit that a touch of pride and stubbornness may enter into keeping me sincere and outspoken without consideration for others. And it seems to me that I restrain myself a little less whenever it would be appropriate to restrain myself more, and that I react against the respect I owe by growing more heated. It may be, too, that I let myself follow my nature for lack of art. When I display to great men the same freedom of tongue and bearing that I exercise in my own house, I feel how much it inclines towards indiscretion and incivility. But besides the fact that I am made that way, that's a very important phrase in Monday. Besides the fact that I am made that way, this is my nature. I'm quite candid, quite outspoken. I don't dissimulate. Of course he dissimulates, but he says, this is how I am. I speak my mind. I have not a supple enough mind to sidestep a sudden question and escape it by some dodge, or to invent a truth, or a good enough memory to retain something thus invented, and certainly not enough assurance to maintain it. And I put on a bold face because of weakness. Therefore, I give myself up to being candid and always saying what I think by inclination and by reason, leaving it to fortune to guide the outcome. So this is very interesting. He's not only made that way, it's not only his nature to be outspoken, but he says, I have a poor memory, so the artfulness of dissimulating itself would be difficult. The idea of his having a poor memory is something I want to come back to a little bit when I talk about his critique of confession. So, Montaigne uh, seems at first um, to be quite like Calvin, at least on this idea of bemoaning the practice of dissimulation. But if we want to look at how he differs from Calvin, I think the easiest way to do this is to look at the, what Montaigne has to say about confession. Um, Calvin when he talked about confession, was talking about religious confession. Montaigne, a judge in Bordeaux, is talking about religious confession, for sure. But he's also talking about confession in the courtroom. So confession before the priest and confession in the courtroom. And this is really, this is really an important point to kind of help us through the rest of the presentation on Montaigne. He's going to critique confession before a judge or before a priest, because he believes it's inevitably going to distort the truth about the self. So think about this. I, I think the easiest way to think about this as students is how often it happens that we're given a questionnaire to fill out, and it asks us a yes or no question, and either one would be wrong. We, we don't believe the yes, we don't believe the no. Or if you give a deposition or you're, you're uh, deposed in a courtroom, um, you're, you might want to answer a question a certain way, and you're instructed that you must simply say, did that happen or did that not happen? And you feel a violation to your own identity in that process. If you go through a practice of, of sacerdotal confession, the confession can be guided by the priest. So, so for example, you may not think of a certain practice as sinful at all until it's suggested to you that it is sinful. One of my very favorite discoveries as a historian of the early modern world was in Henry Common's book on early modern Spain, reading that there were these inquisitors in the in villages in Spain. <laughs> in the er, er, this is early 17th century, so Trent is over. And Common reports that these inquisitors announced from the pulpit that fornication is a sin and the villagers are surprised to learn this. this is, I think this is the worst moment in early modern Europe where people discover that fornication <laughs> is a sin. That fornication has been fine, and then suddenly it's a sin. So the self is shaped by these institutions, the Inquisition, the courtroom. And what Montaigne is really pushing back against, and I think this is very important in terms of questions of political power and the autonomy of the self under a monarchy, what Montaigne is really pushing back against is the idea that his self can be known through these institutional practices of sacerdotal confession on the one hand, 
or courtroom deposition on the other. Those are, they're records of the self on one level, but they're also fundamentally distortions of the self. And so the essays is a way to provide a different way of representing the self that I think is a quite brilliant response to uh, the narrow ways that uh, confession, uh, either in the courtroom or in the church, uh, does not enable the representation of the self. In the views he expresses, for example, on repentance, Montaigne does not reject repentance entirely. For those sins, he writes, that are out of character, those sins in which we are carried away by passion, what could repent and credibly promise not to do them again. So there's certain sins of passion that maybe they happen once, you can repent, you will not do it again. But um, as far as other sins go that are repeated and planned and premeditated, these are constitutional sins. They're even professional or vocational sins. And Montaigne writes, I cannot imagine that they can be implanted so long in one of the same heart without the reason and conscience of their possessor constantly willing and intending it to be so. And the repentance which he claims comes to him at a certain prescribed moment is a little hard for me to imagine and conceive. So you, you constantly commit a certain kind of sin, and you repent, and you continue. It's semper peccator. You're always going to be bringing those sins back. So repentance is not possible for those sins that are constitutional. Um, the mind and one's desires have already consented. They're practiced over and over again. They're habits. They're rooted and anchored in a strong and vigorous will and cannot be denied. To Montaigne, it would be hypocritical to claim that one can repent of them and be changed or reformed. For in such case, cases, he writes, repentance is nothing but a disavowal of our will and an opposition of our fancies. The most concrete example of the limits of repentance is Montaigne's discussion in his essay on some verses of Virgil of his own sexuality. This is an essay that many scholars have written about with attention to the history of sexuality, but it's also the case that in this text, Montaigne not only reflects on his love affairs, but also reflects in the most serious way in the essays on the limits of confession. Sexuality is a particularly rich field in which to explore the limits of confession as transformative. And on this front, on some verses of Virgil, derive their importance largely from the way they illuminate Montaigne's notion of self and what can be said about the self. For many in Europe at this time, the discourse of sexuality was the discourse of the confessional, at least in theory. In this sense, Montaigne's essay might be read as a kind of counter-confession. He repudiates the idea that sex is in any way shameful. What has a sexual act, so natural, so necessary, and so just, done to mankind for us not to talk about it without shame and for us to exclude it from serious and decent conversation? Montaigne's language about sexuality celebrates its naturalness. He talks about it openly because it's a fundamental part of who he is. And it is not an act that is confined, he says, to marriage. Marriage, he writes, has for its share utility, justice, honor, and constancy, a flat pleasure, but more universal. Love is founded on pleasure alone, and in truth, its pleasure is more stimulating, lively and keen, a pleasure inflamed by difficulty. But despite these differences, there is in both cases, as Montaigne describes it, something profoundly natural about the body reaching out to another body. But he also complicates the notion of sexuality and confession, or really of confession, by treating his own sexuality over the span of his adulthood. And this is where a confession at one point in time would make no sense to Montaigne. 
The truth about oneself, Montaigne shows, cannot be limited to one moment. Quite different from Calvin. His view of his past acts, one's views of one's past acts, change over time. Thus, Montaigne's essay is simultaneously confession of his youthful pursuits of the pleasure of the body. And Montaigne has already forgiven himself for these because they were pleasures always sought with his mistresses under the aegis of honesty. And of his now mature, even aging pursuits of the memory of pleasure. He's not talking about his sexuality to reform his youth. He's explicit about this. His recollection of his pleasures is an important solace. He not only does not condemn his thoughts, he savors them. They rescue him from his melancholia. He had been particularly clear about the fact that confession is not transformative in his essay on repentance, where, with considerable irony, he condemns those older men, older men who now claim to be pure. And this is one of my very favorite passages from Montaigne. I hate the accidental repentance that age brings. The man who said that he was obliged to the years for having rid him of sensuality has a different viewpoint from mine. I shall never, Montaigne adds, be grateful to impotence for any good it may do me. Youth and pleasure in other days did not make me fail to recognize the face of vice in voluptuousness, nor does the distaste that the years bring make me fail to recognize the face of voluptuousness and vice. Now that I am no longer in that state, I judge it as though I were in it. Equally important in understanding the view of Montaigne's idea about the limits of confession is to recognize that unlike Calvin, he rejects the idea of the narrative self. The idea of the narrative self, in many ways, in Calvin, reflects St. Augustine's confessions. they remarkably, and this is a problem in Montaigne's studies, it seems that Montaigne, while he knew much of St. Augustine, did not know the confessions, although that seems almost impossible. Maybe this is an anxiety of influence case where you never mention Augustine's confessions because you're so deeply influenced by him. In the Augustine narrative, life takes on meaning around certain key turning points. And the individual was seen as a pilgrim on an earthly journey. The Augustinian self is represented with, in the framework of the narrative grace, of grace. The essays, by contrast, do not assume, and this is maybe the most famous aspect about the essays, a narrative form. Montaigne does not share Augustine's view that reform of the self was possible. Montaigne captures himself not through a narrative of his life, but through essays, brief accounts of different Montaigne's and different associations. And that is itself fascinating. It's the choice to represent the self, not as it becomes popular to do in the 17th century through autobiography and conversion and a clear narrative, but the representation of the self is done in a more fragmentary and associative way. So Montaigne rejects the idea of a meaningful confession. Um, but he doesn't reject the idea of sincerity. For Montaigne, sincerity is not the expression generated by the heart at one moment in time. Rather, sincerity is a sustained effort to come to terms with one's own identity. It's a practice, being sincere. It's not something. Calvin's sincerity is a practice in terms of confession. But for Montaigne, it's a, by practice, I mean it takes a sustained effort to be sincere, to know what is inside of oneself. Montaigne has, he writes, ordered himself to say all that he can. The disease of the soul, he writes, the diseases of the soul grow more obscure and stronger. That is why they must be handled often in the light of the day with a pitiless hand be opened up and torn from the hollow of our breast. So knowing himself is a practice that requires a sustained effort. It's not only one of self-disclosure. It's a matter of frank talk about what is inside oneself. 
for example, sexuality, which is usually disavowed, hidden, or disguised. Montaigne's perturbed by the hypocrisy of those who send their conscience to the brothel, but keep their countenance in good order. And he declares in an explicitly ironic passage that he will take a different passage. This is from his essay on repentance. In honor of the Huguenots, who condemn our private and auricular confession, I confess myself in public, religiously and purely. St. Augustine, Origen, and Hippocrates have published the errors of their opinions. I, besides those of my conduct, I am hungry to make myself known. And I care not to how many, provided it be truly. Or to put it better, I am hungry for nothing. But I have a mortal fear of being taken to be other than I am by those who come to know my name. So he wants to be known, but not through an act of confession, but through an act of writing the essays, which is a sustained effort to know himself. And as you know, the essays are constantly being revised by Montaigne. He's constantly improving upon the knowledge of himself. From Montaigne's standpoint, the central problem with confession, and I don't think this is an exaggeration, lay in its insincerity. From his perspective, to confess was to enter in too easily into a claim of self-knowledge and of reform. Either this would be a cheapened mo mode of reform, for example, that of the old man repenting of his youthful excesses, or an unnecessary one. But this does not mean that he's not committed to a different form of sincerity. So not the expressive, transformative sincerity of Calvin, but rather an introspective or even an ethnographic sincerity. His gaze is upon his self, and this gaze resembles his gaze upon others, both within his own culture and beyond. He reports and he portrays. He does not express in Augustinian fashion his thoughts or feelings, and he does not confess. I study myself more than any other subject. That is my metaphysics, that is my physics. In the essays, Montaigne has in fact made himself his subject. And the curious result is that he's both the observer and the observed. But he does not resemble, he does not render the self stable. To the contrary, the subject he observes is not constant. It's always in motion. He compares his mind to a runaway horse that gives birth to so many shimmers and fantastic monsters, one after the other without order or purpose, that in order to contemplate their ineptitude and strangeness at my pleasure, I have begun to put them in writing. He's various on the one side. To portray himself truly could not be to say, I'm now happy, I'm now sad, I'm now anxious, I'm now angry. It's a more complex process. Others four men, he writes at the beginning of his essay on repentance, adding, I tell of him and portray a particular one. Very, very ill-formed. Um, now the lines of my painting do not go astray, though they change and vary. The world is but a perennial movement. I cannot keep my subject still. It goes along befuddled and staggering with a natural drunkenness. I take it in this condition just as it is at the moment I give my attention to it. I do not portray being, I portray passing. This is a record of various thoughts and changeable occurrences and irresolute and when it so befalls, contradictory ideas. Whether I am different myself or whether I take hold of my subjects in different circumstances and aspects. But the self is not only changeable, it's complex to know. We are all patchwork, and so shapeless and diverse in composition that each bit, each moment, plays its own game. And there is as much difference between us and ourselves as between us and others. Consider it a great thing to play the part of a single man. man. In view of this, a sound intellect will refuse to judge men simply by their outward actions. We must probe the inside and discover what springs a man to motion. But since this is an arduous and hazardous hazardous undertaking, I wish fewer people would meddle with it. It is nonetheless true that Montaigne's decision to write, to take an inventory of himself in different moments and in different settings or in different associations, helps him in the end get at something more fixed. 
In modeling this figure upon myself, I have had to fashion and compose myself so often to bring myself out that the model itself has to some extent grown firm and taken shape. So this idea that maybe even in this various self which is in passing and movement, passing not being, there is a, a model. Painting myself for others, I have painted my inward self with colors clearer than my original ones. Have I wasted my time by taking stock of myself continually so carefully? For those who go over themselves only in their minds and occasionally in speech, do not penetrate to essentials in their examination, as does the man who makes that his study, his work, and his trade, who binds himself to keep an enduring account with all his face, with all his strength. That's what the essays is. An effort to provide a portrait of a self. It's an extraordinary text. What an amazing thing to do. Not to say I'm revealing myself by confessing on one occasion in a courtroom or in the confessional, but to reveal myself through a practice that extends over 30 years of writing and rewriting and remaking this portrait. It is in this dynamic sense, with a deep consciousness of the mutability, even the fluidity of the self, that Montaigne claims he is setting forth nature and not artifice. This is where his claim for sincerity comes. Those of us especially who live a private life that is on display only to ourselves must have a pattern established within us by which to test our actions. And according to this pattern, now pat ourselves on the back, now punish ourselves. I have my own laws and court to judge me. And I address myself to them more than anyone else. I'm my own courtroom. I'm my own priest. There is no one who, if he listens to himself, does not discover in himself a pattern, all his own, a ruling pattern, which struggles against education and against the tempest and passions. Montaigne was disturbed by hypocrisy, like many in his generation. He warned his, meeting, his readers not to let themselves be taken in by either the face or the words of one who takes pride in being always different outside and inside. But Montaigne did not believe as I've emphasized, the confession of the traditional religious or legal sense could close the gap between one's interior and one's public life. If that is, sincerity was for Mon most of Montaigne's contemporaries the outward expression or avowal of one's internal beliefs and feelings, an ethic modeled on confession. For Montaigne, sincerity was a far more wrenching process not the expression of one's beliefs or feelings, but rather the portrayal of one's being. This was his most radical claim. I want to be seen here in my simple, natural, ordinary fashion without straining or artifice, for it is myself I portray. The image of portraiture is fundamental. Even when Montaigne discusses his frankness, it is though he's describing a kind of hydraulic process and not a sense of the need to express himself. But besides the fact that I am made this way, I am not supple enough of mind to sidestep a sudden question and escape it by some dodge or to invent a truth, or of a good enough memory to retain something thus invented. I give myself up to being candid and always saying what I think by inclination and by reason. First, as with Calvin, it's based on a profound sense of the interiority of the individual. And again makes the assumption that the individual has it in his or her power, either to conceal or to reveal what is inside. But unlike Calvin, this is the second point, who stressed the narrative structure of the self and the possibility of redemption, Montaigne sees the self as far more recalcitrant, as something fundamental to our natures and not as easily redeemed, even if the self is not static but always in motion. Moreover, on the same point, Montaigne offers a profoundly embodied notion of the self, one that cannot be understood in light of the soul alone. Finally, Montaigne shifts the locus of the self from the storm of nature within us, the storm of nature as reflected in Luther and then Calvin's comments on the book of Psalms, floating outside of Montaigne's inner self 
that is, is the observant I, or ego, of the author. Montan self is, as Jean Stachowinski has observed, a dialectical self. It's once, at once, the observing je, the observing I, and the moi, the self observed. Scholars disagree about this I and the self, the je and the moi, in, le moi in Montan, um, and exactly how they're related. But it's by no means clear that Montaigne would have reduced his true identity to his inner self alone. Or to put it in a simpler form, if for Calvin the self was the heart, for Montaigne the self was the constant interplay of mind and heart, of judgment and feeling, of stability and change. Now the self, as Charles Taylor and, and many others have emphasized, and as I noted at the beginning of my talk, is not a universal category, but rather a historical one, and one that we must in many ways understand as a construct, although I have some problems with the idea of social constructionism, but, but nonetheless, I do think there's validity in thinking of, of constructionism playing a role. How might, might we best account for these new forms of identity? Ideas that both overlapped and differed from one another. What social cultural forces were at work in the 16th century? Given these two lives, our focus needs to be on France in the 1500s. Calvin was born in 1509 and died in 1563. Montaigne was born in 1533 and died in 1592. Calvin was of relatively modest origins, was driven into exile by the growing repression against the evangelicals and heretics under Francois I. Montaigne, a nobleman, was writing at the times of the wars of religion. And indeed, the writings of both men show that they were responding often to the political and social turmoil around them. So this is very brief and very quick to think about the social context. The emphasis on the expressive self um, was widespread in Protestant thought for thinking about Calvin. But there's a large and rich literature on the ways in which the social turmoil of the period unleashed a variety of anxieties to which the religious reformers sought to respond, and therefore we can make a case that Calvin's emphasis on sincerity was a response to particular anxieties of his period. The most obvious line, I think, to explore here would be the way in which Calvin's ideas about sincerity were shaped by his own experience of exile. Exile haunts Calvin throughout his entire existence. He was, in many ways, uh, exiled from his own father's home at a very young age, four or five. His mother died when he was very young, and he was raised in another family. He always felt a certain homelessness. But he was also exiled, or went into exile from France, shortly after the Repression began in 1533. Perhaps the ideal of sincerity was a desire to find spaces, which he eventually would find in Geneva, in which he could speak freely. It certainly doesn't seem accidental to make this connection if we think that his moment of exile coincided with that of Nicholas Kopp, who was the rector of the University of Paris and a friend of Calvin's. And we have a record of Kopp's response to the growing repression of the evangelicals by the French monarchy. In response to the repressive measures, Kopp stated, "Why then do we conceal the truth rather than why then do we conceal the truth rather than speak it out boldly? Is it right to please men rather than God, to fear those who can destroy the body but not the soul? The will of the wicked are wont to label as heretics, impostors, seducers, and evil speakers those who strive purely and sincerely to penetrate the minds of believers with the gospel. But happy and blessed are they." who endure with this composure, giving thanks to God in the midst of affection and bravely bearing calamities. Onward then, O Christian men, with our every muscle, let us strive to attain this great bliss, this bliss of speaking sincerely, which we can find outside of a repressive context. <coughs> but sincerity is a paradoxical virtue. While promising freedom, it also would constitute an ordeal for those who followed the Reformed faith as elaborated by Calvin. For it was closely related 
to the need to make the individual the basis of discipline and order. Sincerity in Calvin not only had an expressive function, it would also quickly come to have, even in Calvin's own writings, a repressive function. With the traditional social order largely broken up, Calvinists began to order the individual even with tests of purity, one of the meanings of sincerity. The Calvinist was not only encouraged to be expressive, but was also pressured to examine his or her own inner life to find marks of sincerity. This is a very interesting idea in Calvinism, that, that, that we have time. I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm almost done. Um, to find marks of sincerity. So we have, we have in, in 17th century England, for example, among the Puritans, there, we actually have um, exams that you could administer yourself to determine whether or not you were pure of heart. This becomes part of the repressive function of Calvin. So the, the sort of traditional ideas of Calvin being repressive about drunkenness and luxury and avarice and other vices and sexuality, so different from, from Montaigne, is related to this idea of finding a sincerity that orders oneself. Just briefly on Montaigne, um, Montaigne has quite a different view that is in many ways, I would argue, shaped by his status as a nobleman during the wars of religion. The idea that one is living in a very dangerous world about expression. But he also critiques confession because it is confessional fervor and zealotry that fuels much of the violence of the wars of religion. So he's, he's, he sees confession not only as a problematic, in terms of the argument I made earlier, that it can't really be true because it's only one moment in time, maybe I've misremembered, it will be false because it doesn't capture my complexity. He also sees confession from this ethical vantage point that the desire to confess as a Huguenot, or the desire to confess as a Catholic, fuels much of the violence of his own period. So I will stop there. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you John very much for this wonderful, wonderful um, talk as well as for your previous work that has really helped me share my own thoughts and ideas about um, similar or at least related um, topics. So what I'm going to say is extremely fragmented. I was um, not trying to come up with a systematic critique of the talk. I think it's been too, the talk has been too um, wealthy and interesting to, to try such an effort. So instead there are some points, some observations, some questions that I want to raise. And I must say they're all over the place. They are from, uh, they, they go from early modern uh, uh, Europe to, to uh, theology, <coughs> to some postmodernist ideas about the self, to psychoanalysis, if not temple whatsoever, a very Montanian way, no attempt whatsoever to put order into, into it. Um, let's start with the observation that the ancients and Virgil uh, among them already lamented that we don't have windows into people's souls. And uh, therefore, we can never tell how honest they are. And um, I'm wondering, uh, as a starting point, what's the difference between honesty and sincerity? What's, uh, what's the difference that you uh, are trying to articulate between the Manifestation uh, and articulations of, 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 of sincerity in early uh, uh, modern Western Europe to uh, previous um, attempts to, to, to deal with the question. Sincerity, as you say, is a virtue, um, but it is also a speech act. And it's a speech act whether it's pronounced out loud or to self. Um, so there is not Sincerity without truth telling, without what we call called veridiction, uh, both verus and dictio. Um, so there is no sincerity that is not rhetorical, as, as you pointed out um, yourself, and as such, necessarily, there is no sincerity that does not adhere to rhetorical and linguistic pre-existing uh, forms uh, of discourse, and as much there is no sincerity that can be verbalized outside of, or mediated outside of societal norms. 
the authentic self, the sincere self, in other words, cannot exist outside of language and therefore cannot exist out of society and therefore cannot exist out, out, outside of performing itself. And then there is a tension between being sincere and being a performer. I invoked Foucault not merely because this is what academics always have to do in order to establish credentials uh, and legitimacy when they start a talk, but also because I think more than any other contemporary or almost contemporary philosopher I can think of, he's been asking himself dealing with uh, questions that are pretty similar to what you, John, uh, is asking uh, in your talk or in your current research, what is the nature of sincerity in Christian theology? Uh, for him, what change in the transition from antiquity, pre-Christian to Christian, notions of sincerity, and then again, and here you are talking about the same things, uh, what changed uh, in the transition from the Middle Ages to uh, modernity, and also, of course, the questions of what are the tools that enable us, if there are any, to measure sincerity. Um, so, while John is, of course, right to argue that early modernity was engaged with matters of sincerity, I would suggest that the concern about sincerity was as old, or is as old as human interactions themselves, and undoubtedly it has been expressed in different ways, in different intensities, at different times in history. So uh, John's effort to historicize sincerity and account for its centrality in uh, for early modernists, for early modern Europe, for early modern Europeans, is of course a welcome and extremely important contribution in the ongoing systematic project of dismantling the abstract a historical man, capital M of the uh, Enlightenment into this steady replacement of this man by concrete individuals and regimes of truth that operate in changing circumstances. The presentation has, always, has also been a very important contribution in addition to the ongoing of effort by historians of Catholicism, uh, myself included, to challenge popular narratives of modernity and of individualism, narratives that identify both phenomena with Protestantism, and you were very rightly very explicit about it. Put simply, uh, I think this narrative of modernity, uh, whose godfather was uh, maybe Weber, uh, is nothing but a Protestant self-congratulating masquerading as objective uh, science. So talking about masquerading, um, of course, uh, is of course uh, talking about the opposite of sincerity. Uh, and here I want to say something very general that we may or may not want to talk about later in the discussion. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, everyone in uh, Europe, but um, there is an interesting aspect of sincerity. Unmasking fraud causes uh, anxiety. And I'm not sure we always want people to be sincere with us or even with themselves. Uh, in fact, if we believe Freud Deception could sometimes be as healthy as complete exposure or self-exposure. Uh, Obviously, Calvin and Montaigne would disagree, even though I think Montaigne, <coughs> and I think you've pointed it out very nicely, Montaigne is uh, constantly masking himself by revealing <coughs> what he chooses to reveal. We know so much about what he thinks about sexuality, we know absolutely nothing about what he did with whom uh, and how. So there is a discourse about sexuality that tells us absolutely nothing about his own sexual life, appearing under the title, and here I'm going to tell you everything about my sex life. Um, but, but and surely Calvin was not very sincere about And I'm sure Calvin uh, had a lot to say about his own sex life. <laughs> Uh, but but uh, so, so Calvin and Montaigne would obviously disappear, would disagree for them saying about sincerity, lack of sincerity. But I think that we should not. Uh, but I think we should oppose. We should be careful of creating a dichotomy between good and evil, or sincerity and dissimulation. Uh, I think we have to maintain a much more complex relationship. 
a between the two of them. But this is a very general observation. We may or may not want to do something with it. I, 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 I'll go back to early modern um, um, Europe. So you're arguing that there are two, in fact three, but uh, we didn't get to uh, Spinoza, uh, that there are two forms of thinking about and practicing sincerity. There is the Calvinist hypothesis manner of expressivity and there is Montaigne Catholic model of fragmented interiority. All take as a given the existence of something called interiority and all assume that there is a self that possesses a truth about itself. And while for Calvin and Protestants the self we conceptualize and I, and I assume experienced biographically, for Montaigne the self is fragmented, embodied, and refuses to make itself coherent. It is also garbled, and I think it's a very nice record to give there, floating outside and yet inside Montaigne's inner self is Montaigne's observing self. Les jeux observateurs et les mois observés. There are two, there are, no, not two, there are Siamese twins, whose coexistence is a source of confusion, and I would again argue anxiety, because who wants to live with an evil twin who constantly nags and judges? So I would like to think together about the relationships between the je and the moi, or between the acting and the observing to um, selves. I want to widen it and argue that dualities of truth has always characterized Western culture. I mean, going back to Foucault, Foucault talked about the tension between the Delphine know thyself and the Athenian care for thyself. He didn't use this um, Delphine Athenian division, I'm using it, but I think that's what he had in mind. The Athenian theory of knowledge of the self argues that one ought to work hard to make oneself in the image of what, what, what one wants to create of oneself. The Delphine model is that there is an inner truth that one is already it, and one needs not create oneself, but rather discover this own inner truth that is already within oneself. And in Christianity, of course, there is also a duality. There is the... Um, Christianity is, of course, the religion that binds an individual to the obligation to, surf, to search for the certain... for the secret deep within the self. A certain secret that it's only when it is brought into the light of day and is manifested can play a decisive role in the path to salvation. But there are actually two truths in Christianity. There is the truth of revelation, capital R, and there is the truth of revelation, low key R, the truth that we may or may not find when we reveal to ourselves our inner truth. And I'm not sure, and Christians have never been sure about the exact relationship between the capital R and low-key uh, R revelations. Um, and as you say, knowledge of the self is required by the fact that the heart must be purified in order to understand the divine word. But it can only be purified by self-knowledge. And some degree of grace is already necessary to be able to achieve a degree of self-knowledge. So in order to be able to undertake purification, the heart must already be purified to some degree in order to realize the self-knowledge would now allow it to continue the process of reaching the sincerity of being purified. So there is a circular relationship between self-knowledge, knowledge of the truth, knowledge of the internal truth, knowledge of the divine truth, and care of uh, the self. And I think is interesting when you try to think of what actually is this thing we call sincerity. One cannot tell one's truth 
to oneself or whisper it into one's pillow. Uh, and that's a term of very diction that, that, that uh, Foucault, I think, could have contributed, uh, he coined the term and contributed to the um, uh, discussion. And obviously in Christianity, this act of very diction is a precondition for um, salvation. And as we know, it was mandatory, it was a sacrament. And I want to pause for a second and think about this sacrament, I want us to pay attention. We're so used to talking about it and thinking about it, that I'm not sure we pay enough attention to how bizarre the metaphysical foundation of this notion is. And I think in a way you said it yourself, and I'm going to repeat it. Uh, confession is the dogmatic truth that argues the following. One, that there is, a, that a person can reveal itself totally and fully to him or herself or to another person. Two, that the person can be led to experience contrition for his or her transgressions. Three, that telling the truth about one's transgressions and feelings, in the feeling of contrition, enable the listener and God to forgive the teller, the truth teller. And finally, the telling the truth about oneself to another leads in the long run for, to, to some sort of self-improvement. Uh, 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 in, in and I think you pointed out that Montaigne, rightly so, uh, points out that distortions are unavoidable. If distortions are unavoidable, and he's right to point out that, but, but so I know that sacramentally it works, but physically I think there is an issue here with, with confession that, 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 that we want to think about. I think Montaigne did not understand the theology of uh, confession. Yeah. Yes. Okay, but speaking historically, not physically, obviously there is a long process of interiorization of penance, of the sacrament of penance. It starts in the 13th century and goes throughout the period. Slowly, the role of the penitential obligation of satisfaction decreases while contrition and repentance become the more significant and more important aspect of the sacrament. And I think it's interesting that this internalization of the sense of sin uh, went hand in hand with an exteriorization of guilt. The confessant was to repent internally, to tell the truth to a confessor, but and to manifest sincere, to manifest sincere contrition, but then also to perform external acts of satisfaction. And I want to, and I emphasize this chronology because it makes me wonder whether the 16th century is really a crucial moment of transition in practices of expressive sincerity and of confession, or whether we should talk about the longer transformation of penitential discourse that was shared by the two Christian Western denominations. And while the Protestants eliminated the sacramental authority of the confessor, they maintained the belief in the power of sincere speech act to deal. <coughs> I also want to remind us that from the 13th century on, Christianity developed practices of self-knowledge that by the 16th century are already also offered to the laity in both Catholic and Protestant parts of the continent. Two more questions. I, um, the two protagonists uh, uh, of the talk, Calvin and Montaigne, uh, obviously Calvin uh, can definitely stand for um, Protestantism and both for Calvinism. But I wonder um, to what degree Montaigne uh, represents early modern French Catholic theology or thought. I, would, I think it's so wonderful and unique that is probably way too smart to represent uh, Catholicism 
Uh, and again, looking at the larger frame of, of reference, I think it's interesting to think about the revival of Augustinianism and, and its way of shaping the ideas about interiority, and of course the revival of the Stoics, uh, uh, not only as a way of thinking, but also as a way of writing, and, and the degree to which it shaped this framework, the way in which Montaigne is constructing uh, his uh, um, public self. And I want to also remind us that the rediscovery of Stoics and of this kind of discourse uh, is shaped not only um, Montaigne but also uh, Loyola who in turn went to the same school as Calvin. Uh, so we we're talking about people in this time period thinking about the self and articulations of the self and knowledge and self-knowledge. Uh, we should not uh, ignore this additional uh, character in this uh, holy trinity of people who think very, very deeply about self and sincerity and confession in, in the um, uh, 16th um, uh, century. Um, but put it differently, if, 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 if I'm right that there is a continuity in the theology of confession, um, so continuity, if, there is a, if I'm right that there is a continuity in the theology of, 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 of confession uh, from, from pre-Reformation and pre-Trent Catholicism to post-Reformation, uh, post-Luther, post-Trent Catholicism, the question is whether thinking through the framework of the division of Protestantism and, and, and versus Catholicism is the best framework to think about the changes uh, that are, um, that, uh, that are uh, taking, um, taking place. Now, I, I have one more point, and you're talking about, uh, which I thought was a, a fantastic, interesting observation. Your presentation of Calvinism that promotes and shapes form, form, a form of forms of truth-telling that connect interiority with exteriority in affect and speech, but Montaigne at the same time stands for the inner working of the soul. And I think it's fascinating because usually traditional historiography, of course, talks about Protestantism is the religion of the inner working of the soul, and Catholicism is the one of exteriority and, and, and the sort of public demonstrations of internal in, in, Truth. Last but not least, um, there is as much difference between us and ourselves as between us and others. I'm quoting you, quoting uh, Montaigne. And of course, this is an amazing, beautiful uh, observation. It's a very, very modern statement. Um, it, it takes a huge amount of courage to live with this awareness that one is not, cannot even know oneself, and that one is constantly changing. Uh, and again, I'm going back to psychoanalysis, of so this kind of general thing. The liquidity of the self uh, is, uh, is a major, or plays a major role in psychopathology, and, and is a source of a huge amount of discussion, psychoanalytical um, um, uh, discussion, liquidity takes us back to purity, to metaphors that you abuse yourself. So I think there is some nice um, things that we can do. Uh, we can play um, with with it. But 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 let me finish with another thing that he that he um, that Montaigne says. He goes on to point out that, and I quote: "In modeling this figure upon myself." It's through the act of performing and writing about the performance that I had to fashion and compose myself so often to bring myself out that the model itself has to start some extent grown firm and taken shape. Painting myself for others, I've painted my inward self with colors clearing, clearer than my original ones. If I understand him correctly, at the end of the day, he is telling us that it's only by putting on a show, by masquerading as a self, 
or as many different selves by being insincere, by telling tales about himself that he ended up becoming his own self. So this is a self that is nothing by, but the accumulation of multiple attempts to discover a core identity that actually does not exist. That's bombastic enough in our land here. 